Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. It's available on Progressive Radio Network and Pacifica Radio Network and iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube and SoundCloud and at opednews.com slash podcasts. My guest for the show is Barry Lynn. He directs the Open Markets Institute. Previously, he spent 15 years at the New American Foundation researching and writing about monopoly power. He's author of Cornered the New Monopoly Capitalism and the Economics of Destruction and End of the Line, the Rise and Coming Fall of the Global Corporation. His writings on the political and economic effects of the extreme consolidation of power in the United States have influenced the thinking of policymakers and antitrust professionals on both sides of the Atlantic. His website is openmarketsinstitute.org slash staff slash Barry hyphen C hyphen Lynn, L-Y-N-N. His new book is Liberty from All Masters, The New American Autocracy Versus the Will of the People. And it's a powerful analysis of the power of monopolies in the U.S. and the world. And welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, what I wanted to start off doing is read something from right near the end of your book, which doesn't give you anything away, but it's, it's really inspiring and it's very well written. I really liked it. So I'm excerpting here. The sword in your hand. Perhaps one day you will behold your own hand shining before you. Perhaps one day soon it will be your own eyes sparkling with inspiration that you see in the mirror. But what about right now, today? Will you dare today to recognize, even without such signs, the glory within you? Will you dare today to recognize that you already have the power to destroy and to create, the power to break what must be broken and to heal what has been torn? Are you ready yet to stand against a few men armed with immense machines designed to crush your life and the lives of your children and the life of your world? Are you ready yet to stand against these few men who in their actions, if not their words, mock the sacrifices of your grandparents and great parents, who mock the blood spilled by generations. You're asking a lot of people. And you're basically, the, your book, your book is basically a, a call to take back what we've given away over the last one or two generations and that the presidents on, in both parties have given away. So uh, I'm going to finally let you talk. <laughs> what do you want this book to do? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the, the two things, really. Uh, one is for to really help people understand just the magnitude of the threat that is posed by today's monopolists. And this is true, especially of Google, Facebook, and Amazon, you know, and uh, you know, we, we know we have a monopoly problem and there's been action against it, but uh, I want people to understand that these corporations have the ability to destroy our society, our ability to communicate with each other as we have known it. And uh, so that's one of the main things I detail in this book. That's the warning. And then the other side is really just to say, hey, you know, as, as bad as it seems right now, and I know that people feel have felt really hopeless and, you know, they felt hopeless because of the what we're seeing in our climate and, and you know, there's the, the, the rapid change in, in our environment and all the fires and, and the, the seeming sort of collapse of natural systems. And, and people look around and they see this dysfunction in our politics and that makes them sad and, 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 and uh, uh, hopeless. And people look around and they see just this massive concentration of power and they feel like there's no way to, to deal with this concentration of power. And I wanted to help people understand that we have every single tool and we have, you know, every single institutional tool, every single law we need uh, to fix everything that we need to fix, to set right everything that we need to set right. And uh, we just need to clear our minds of these ideas of the, that have been put into us, our, our, our heads over the last 35 years. And, um, you know, See, you see ourselves the way people in America used to see ourselves, and we can do anything, and we shall. And you talk about dangers of ignorance of who you are and what shapes you and how others shape you, and that this is why we now face the gravest threat to liberty and democracy in America and to equality and individual dignity since the days of slave power. Talk about that. 
Yeah, this is a, um, you know, we, in our society, we've had a, you know, last generation, we've had all these fantastic successes in, in terms of what we sometimes call as identity politics, you know, but in terms of, you know, people, you know, when it comes to gender equality and race and these, you know, uh, people sort of really coming into their own and, and saying, you know, this is who I am and I'm going to be me. And, and, and whatever way that I want to exist, I'm going to be me. This is how I feel. And that's a type of liberty. And it's a, it's a fantastically important kind of liberty. And people have taken that. And it's like I said, you're not going to define me. That's the key thing. You're not going to define who I am. I'm not going to live in the box that you create. I'm going to live the life that I want to live. When it comes to the political economy, when it comes to our lives as actors, you know, in, in, mar in the market, uh, in, in our daily lives, when we go to work, uh, we let other people define us completely. What we does that look people... like? Well, it means that, uh, you know, uh, it, it means that um, um, we're confined, for instance, as, as consumers. You know, that's actually, that's one of the things I write about in the book is how legally, <laughs> when it comes to anti-monopoly law, we are defined as consumers. That's that, you know, and, but we're also, every one of us is a producer, right? So if every one of us brings ideas to market every day, every one of us is, is thinking all the time and, and, and you know, has, is being creative. Uh, every person is bringing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, different kinds of products to market. It could be just your labor, you know, it could be, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the work you do within a, a store that you make. It could be the, um, you know, the crop that you bring to market. So in this country, we used to see ourselves mainly as producers. As, as people citizens. Who make you you, you and, differentiate yeah. between being consumers and citizens. In the book. Consumers and citizens. And, and as citizens. You know, we saw ourselves not as consumers. That was, you know, the last, it was like the bottom of the list, well, you know, as, but we saw ourselves as people who make things, who think things, who have ideas. And uh, what we used to do is say, this is who I am. And I'm going to fight to achieve this reality that I, um, you know, I'm going to create this business. I'm going to like live this kind of life. I'm going to be my own boss. I'm not going to get sort of battered every day by some some big corporation, you know, that's spying on me and telling me what to do. So the point, you know, one of the the main points I'm trying to get across in this this the book is really, hey, you know, it's like we've had our identity stolen from us uh, in you know uh, in the political economy, which you know we've uh, we've let other people turn us into workers. We've let other people turn us into consumers. We've let other people turn us into gig economy employee, you know, employees. And it's like, we should be able to choose in the same way that we choose in our personal lives, who we are in our public lives and our economic lives. Now, I've had a number of other guests on the show who have talked about this differentiation between being a consumer and being a citizen. And what they say is when you are turned into a consumer, you're disconnected from your community, you're disconnected from your family, and you become, your relationship is with things, not with people. And I, I think what you do here is you describe the process really nicely in your book of how that happens, and you get into the history of how that evolved and that it's really a, a relatively new and recent development. Yeah, and this is, and, and it, it, is, it is a legal development, you know, so, I mean, for 200 years, you know, going back to the Declaration of Independence, Declaration of Independence said, hey, we're citizens, we want liberty, we want democracy, we want to be independent, we don't want to have a boss. You know, the, the Declaration of Liberty was Declaration of Liberty from the British Imperial State, it was also a declaration of liberty from other people. It's like, I'm, I'm not going to depend on anybody. I'm going to be my own boss. And so we built a whole world around that idea of, I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to, no one's going to boss me around. It took a while to get all the way there. You know, we, it was, originally it was just for white, uh, relatively well-off white men. Then it was for poor white men. Then it was extended to black men. Then it was taken back away from black men. You know, then it was extended to women, you know, but it's, it was a long fight, but we, you know, always fought for more liberty as citizens. And um, for 
you know, after 200 years, uh, this group of economists and, and came along. And these were people who were very closely affiliated with the rich. They were affiliated with people who wanted to get a lot more rich, who wanted to get a lot more powerful. And they came up with the, this idea that rather than having all of these laws serving our interests, protecting our, our interests as citizens, protecting our liberty, protecting our democracy, we should use these laws only to protect our interest as consumers, our welfare as consumers. That's what they call it, the consumer welfare frame. And this was, a, you describe in the book how this is a scam, this is framing. Yeah, yeah, and this was done in the late 70s, it was done in the early 80s. It was done by a guy named Robert Bork. It was done by, you know, he was part of the team of libertarians, you know, neoliberals with Milton Friedman, with, with, uh, 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 with uh, Richard Posner. And uh, what they did is they came up with a, uh, basically the inversion of the American idea, of the American ideal, of the American uh, uh, system of liberty. They, in, they flipped it on its head and they sold it. They sold it really well. And, and, and I, when, I, when I think of that, I think of Friedman. Not, yeah. I, I don't know as much about Bork, but uh, I've learned a little bit from reading your book. Uh, but Friedman, I mean, the Chicago School of Economics, they literally put together a propagandization system that where they trained leaders to go out to their countries throughout the world and deregulate and, and create chaos. Uh, and uh, Naomi Klein really did a nice job writing about that in her book, Shock Doctrine. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's um, you know, actually, I mean, um, uh, they, what, actually, I've engaged a lot with Naomi over the years, and actually, what, the one thing I, I would disagree with with, with her is that uh, there's a certain amount of, she implies a certain amount of intent in what they're doing, uh, and actually, I'd say that a lot of these people are a lot sloppier than she would say, that she, you know, they're, it's a, one of the things that's most dangerous about what we've seen with this concentration of power and this, I wrote about this in my first book and my second book, you know, in, in, in End of the Line and in Corner, is that when you concentrate power and you don't govern it well, you, that power ends up destroying things that you rely on. It ends up destroying systems that you rely on. You, you know, one day you wake up and you don't have masks to take care, you know, to protect you from, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a pandemic, right? So, you know, we've, this is a 10 cent item. An N95 mask at you know produced at scale, that's a 10 cent item. We should have enough masks uh, uh, so that every single person who's a frontline worker has those things every day. You know, a new one every day. Every single person in the United States should have as many masks as they want. And this should have been true on day one of the pandemic. But what happened is the machines weren't there to build them. The machines had been destroyed. They had been shipped abroad. They'd been shipped to China. So when we needed the, 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 this, this, this industrial capacity, we didn't have it. This is true for many of our drugs. This is true for the resiliency of our system. So the, uh, what happens when you have monopolists in the system is they destroy to the point where things break down. And uh, the difference with say Naomi Klein is she actually thinks that, in the, that someone is gonna profit from this. They profit only in the near term. In the end, when we break stuff down to this degree, we all end up losing because what you're putting at risk is society itself. So what you're saying then is that these monopolists and the monopolies that they wield, they're dumb and <laughs> short-sighted and they use their power in foolish, misguided ways. Absolutely. The, when you have, I mean, your whole thing, the bottom-up revolution, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, people are smart. And the American system, the original American system was designed to make every single person as smart as possible. And to bring them together so that, you know, deliberative democracy meant people thinking together, people deliberating together. We look around the world and we see a problem or we think we see a problem and we talk about it. Is that a problem? We all look at it together. We, we determine whether it's a problem or not. Okay, it is a problem. We determine together how to fix it. When you concentrate control and thought in the hands of a few, when you concentrate control and thought in the hands of, of you know, a, a giant corporation, when you put control and thought in the hands of an algorithm that is wielded by the most powerful corporation in the world, Google or Amazon, uh, the way that 
that power is used is it's not deliberative, it's not thoughtful, it's not careful, it is destructive. Now we may not see it on any one day how it's destroying, but if we look back at our lives over the last 30 years, we can see all the things that we used to have that we don't have. You well, know, one thing that you point out is that we're blocked off by the monopolists and we're missing the keys to the technological commons, which would enable us to see what the problems are and what we need to do. So the system has created a, a situation where it's harder for us to even see what's going on, especially if we're not conscious that we need to be looking. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, you know, it's like we don't, even, at this point in America, after 35, 40 years of neoliberalism, of 35, 40 years of like hiding the facts from us, 35, 40 years of, of like attributing uh, what happens in the political economy to forces as opposed to political decision. Uh, you know, most of us don't even have the ability to really sort of understand what's happening around us. You know, so, uh, you know, part, you know, the, the, and this is actually one of the main things with, with my book is actually to, you know, in the section, the third section of the book is really about what the neoliberals did, what, what, what Friedman did, what Posner did, what Bork did. And, and, and the point of this is actually to get their thinking out of our heads to get their philosophy out of our heads so we can go back to common sense thinking. That's what America was built on. You know, it's like seeing the facts and responding to the facts, not having a bunch of economists, technocrats determining this for us, but building a system in which all of us are in every way. This is what's so great about your vision, bottom-up revolution. That's what America is all about. It was it was at the beginning a bottom up revolution, and the one it, what it did is it empowered everyone to see and to participate and to get smarter through that and to make a better community and a better world through that bottom up learning. Now you you start the book with with a kind of a history lesson, and what fascinated me that I didn't really know about was what happened during World War, immediately after World War II, and about how the leaders, they made decisions that reflect the kind of philosophy you're talking about, rather than this neoliberal idea. Can you get into that and what the difference was between the way that Europe and Japan, Japan were restructured and their economies rebuilt compared to what is, has been, uh, what's the right word, predatorily inflicted upon who we are now? Yeah, no, and I think that's, that's a great question. And, you know, it, it, progressives, and I worked for a long time in South America as a journalist. I worked in Peru. I worked in Venezuela, you know, I, uh, and, um, you know, uh, I saw, you know, witnessed uh, the American wars down there, the, Amer the drug war, you know, in, in, in Peru. Uh, so I, you know, after, you know, pr progressives have really focused on the bad America since the Second World War, the imperial America, the America that bullies the, the countries of Latin America, the America that bullies the countries of Southeast Asia, you know. Um, and, the, you know, so that's, and that's true. America in many ways since the war has been an imperial bully. But then there's this other America, this, this America that did something very different. And that was after the war, uh, we built a system that tied together the United States and all of Europe, all of Western Europe and Japan and Korea and Taiwan uh, and then eventually other countries as well into a system in which we share, we cooperate, we, uh, uh, we create integrated systems of, of industry that allow us all to be more prosperous and to uh, sort of uh, innovate more quickly and to sort of uh, 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 learn how to live together more safely and more collaboratively uh, with each other day to day so and and i think another concept that that you express in the book is is the con the idea of interdependence how yep. all these countries needed each other and they couldn't just 
go on and have conflict with each other because the system that was created produced that interdependence so that they depended upon each other. Yeah, and, and that it's actually it's one of the parts of, of history that's that we've really uh, both in Europe and the United States, we've done a terrible job of remembering. And this was at the beginning of the you know after the, uh, the, the Second World War. And, um, you know, the, the United States looked at Europe and Europe was falling apart. And the United States basically pushed the Europeans to integrate. It kind of pushed uh, uh, the French to, be, uh, to work with the Germans in a way that would, and uh, what ended up creating the seed of what's the European Union, you know, the, the coal and steel agreement in, in 1950, in which the Germans and the French came together and said, hey, you know what, we've had all these terrible apocalyptic wars with each other that have led to millions of deaths. So what we're going to do is we're going to, to prevent that, we're going to share in the ownership of our coal and our steel capacity so no one can build armament without the other one being able to stop them. So it was like, work together, own things together, and you will not go to war. That's the seed of the European Union. It Isn't was that created. Socialism, though. <laughs> yeah, and, but it was created by the United States. You know, it was created by the Truman administration. It was reinforced by the uh, by the Eisenhower administration. And so that's the America. That's the good America. That's the America we can have again going forward. You know, the last twenty years. You know, since the WTO. You know, since the creation of WTO in the mid '90s. We've gone back to the bad America, the bully America, the America that is forcing other countries to accept rule by corporation, to accept you know rule by uh, uh, patent, you know, and, uh, and you know th the patent theft and, and corporate theft and and lack of control, you know. So um, uh, you know, so there's this, but there's this other pattern, there's this other history of America that we can look back to, and it's it's this democratic America. And, uh, and it's based on these principles. It's based on these principles of, of bottom-up control, of empowering people to be in charge of their own lives and their own thinking uh, and the ways that they interact with each other every day. And you talk about how we're facing the most dangerous time since the Civil War. And we need to take a break now. When we get back, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. We need to pause for about 25 seconds. If I can throw a bumper in. And my guest for this show is Barry Lynn. He directs the Open Markets Institute and he's the author of the book, Liberty from All Masters, The New American Autocracy Versus the Will of the People. Uh, so most dangerous time since the Civil War. You know, and you also say for 200 years we were expanding liberty and now we're not. Yeah. And there's, you know, one way to understand what's happened in this country the last 35 years, because we, we all look around and we all see all these things that aren't working, things that used to work and now they're not working. And we wonder what happened. And, you know, what happened is that we changed how we do competition policy. We changed how we, we, we stopped fighting monopoly. And uh, over the last generation, we've seen massive concentration in healthcare, you know, roll up of all these hospitals, these super hospitals that charge us more and deliver us less. Uh, we've seen roll up of our retail. It's like, you know, uh, uh, a generation ago, Walmart didn't really exist. You know, today Walmart has 5,000 plus stores. In many places, they control 50, 60, 70% of the grocery business. Uh, you know, we see this in, in our agriculture. Agriculture now is entirely dominated. You know, a generation ago, we still had the same type of family farm we created at the beginning of our country the 160 acre farm, a generation ago, that 160 acre farm plotted out in the Northwest Ordinance in, 1880, in 1785. We still had that. Now we have super giant farms. Uh, we have CAFOs. Uh, we have, you know, everything is controlled, uh, you know, all of the livestock business and all of the uh, grain business is controlled by a few corporations. So all of this was unleashed uh, by this change in competition policy. Uh, but what makes today so 
especially dangerous, it's, it's as bad as that is, as bad as having Citibank and Goldman Sachs is, as bad as it is to have the Koch brothers and, and Exxon. Uh, what's happened the last few years is we've seen the rise of Google, Facebook, and Amazon, which have the ability to, they've captured the, the points of control, the choke points, where, peop, uh, where the communication takes place, where, where someone, a, a reporter, a, a publisher, a writer writes something. And then, it, but it, in order to get it to the reader, it has to go across Facebook. It has to go across uh, 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 Google. It, that's the, the main point of connection. And uh, this is true for commerce on, on Amazon. Increasingly, commerce takes place on the, uh, like on, on the Amazon platform. That's where, where a seller and a buyer come together. Google and Facebook and Amazon manipulate manipulate how we communicate with each other. They manipulate how we do business with each other. They manipulate who gets to talk to who. You go to buy a book on Amazon. Now, if you were shopping around, you might end up with book X. Now, Amazon might not want to sell you book X. So Amazon manipulates you so that you end up walking away with book Y. Now, you never even know that book Y existed because you didn't really get to shop around because Amazon controls what you see. Now, this may seem, you know, uh, 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 a bit outrageous. I mean, I think most folks see this as less outrageous than it would, uh, did a few years ago. But this is actually what the what the um, what the uh, the platforms do. And this is one of the things I write about in this book is I explain how they manipulate folks in ways that harm our ability to share information with each other and, and, and to work together. And that's why this is such a dangerous moment in our democracy. Now, now how is this a monopoly? I mean, what I'm getting from this is that this is a different kind of monopoly than the ones before, like the railroads. It's actually, it's a, I'm glad you brought up the railroads because it's actually very similar to the railroads. It's very similar to uh, well, this, uh, you know, Google and Facebook and Amazon are, they're the railroads of our time. They're the telegraph corporations of our time. Now, in, yeah. In, in, yeah, in America, you know, when the, when the railroad corporation came up, they were able originally to manipulate people to, it's like people would, uh, I'm a farmer, I need to get my grain for, uh, from Peoria to Chicago. Now the railroad would could, you know, originally would say, hey, I, you know what? I'm not gonna carry your grain today. I'm gonna carry that guy's grain over there. But you know, you actually, I might carry your grain if you give me a little bit of extra money today, you know? So they, were, they would manipulate people, manipulate their access to this essential service in order to extort money from them. And also to get them to be quiet politically, you know, so you wouldn't complain about this because they could just shut you down. So we, we passed some laws back in the 19th century. And we said, you know what? The railroads have to carry everybody's grain at the same price, same terms of service in the order at which they show up. That's called the common carrier law. And you refer and, to that as it applies to Amazon and Facebook and Google. So in, in the history of America, actually in the history of the world, going back to Roman times, to Babylonian times, Human beings, every time there's somebody who controls an essential monopoly, it could just be a ferry going from one side of a river to another, or it could be a network of, you know, like AT&T. Every time that we have de dealt with one of these essential networks, essential monopolies, we've applied common carrier rules. There's only the only people, the only corporations to whom we've never applied these rules are Google, Facebook, Amazon and a few other super giant platform monopolists like Apple and Microsoft and maybe Twitter. Apple, yeah, it's like Google, Facebook, and Amazon are the most dangerous. They're by far the most dangerous because their entire business model is built around manipulation. Apple manipulates, but most of their money comes from selling things for you know selling things for too high a price. <laughs> They're just a more traditional monopolist. Same with Microsoft. So all five are dangerous, but Google, Facebook, and Amazon, super dangerous. But again, we actually have all the tools we need to fix it. And, and, and we've actually seen just recently, there's a case, you know, the case against Google that was brought by the Department of Justice, 
He's seen a phenomenally important uh, uh, investigation of these uh, corporations by the Cicilline Committee and the House of Representatives. So um, we ain't fixed them yet. Talk more They're, about Cicilline and, and, and his work. Yeah, so, so uh, Congressman Cicilline, I mean, this is, he's a true hero uh, in, in America today. I mean, this, you know, uh, what he did is he um, organized the most far reaching investigation of not just the platform monopolies, but a private concentrated power in America that we've seen in many decades. And um, he uh, carried out the investigation uh, with his staff, his incredible staff. They, they carried out this investigation uh, in a, a very creative and thorough way. And they, uh, I would encourage all people, you know, who, to, who are actually afraid of what's happening in America today to go and, and look at what the Cicilline Committee re uh, report says. And what you see there is a, a very clear explanation of the magnitude of the danger that this is, these corporations threaten our democracy and our liberty. It, uh, but you also have the report shows that how they do it, and it's, but it shows all the different tools that we can use to fix it. What are so, some of the tools we can yeah. use to fix it? Well, part of it is uh, one of the, uh, the most important tool is what I was talking about before, common carrier, just you know, no, uh, no discrimination. Rule of law, if you, if you have a corporation, a monopoly, uh, you have to treat everybody the same. It's just, you know, the same service, same price. It's, it's really rule of law in the private sector. That's what it means. How, do, how would that apply to Amazon? Uh, you know, Amazon would be, uh, you know, there's, you know, uh, uh, eBay has changed somewhat, but like the eBay model is that the person who's selling sets their own price, they set their own terms. You know, it's just the, and what eBay does is they charge a little bit of money you know, just for providing the, the platform, just, a, you know, a couple, couple points off the deal uh, to, you know, to provide the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the space where the deal takes place. Uh, what Amazon does is that um, the, the seller and the buyer don't have any control. Who, you know, the, the seller doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't have control over the terms it says, it doesn't have control even over its own prices. Because Amazon sets prices, Amazon sets terms, Amazon determines who you talk to. So it's um, uh, so we, the model that we have, you know, we we know how, that we can do this online uh, because there are neutralized uh, uh, platforms. Uh, but what we have with with Amazon is one that sort of it 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 manipulates people in order to charge them more, to extract money from them, to extort money from them, and also to quiet them down, to make them so that they're afraid to speak out. You know, we've seen this with book publishers. Book publishers are terrified of talking about Amazon in public because they know that if they do, what, what happened to Hachette in 2015 will happen to them. Amazon what, what, what shut Amazon, down Hachette. What Amazon could do is tweak some algorithm that we'd never know about, but it would make it harder for people to discover the book of that publisher. Yeah. But it's not even just the algorithm. The algorithm just sort of sets the basic framework for what they do. But they're also, they're constantly studying you. This is true for Google. This is true for Facebook. They study you every moment of your day. They study, you know, every single thing you do. They buy all this data, whatever data they're not collecting on their own websites, they're buying all kinds of data from other people. They're collecting all this data from you through your apps. So all, all of this information about you, it's like, you know, you know, your dreams and your fears and, you know, your addictions, you know, your weaknesses, they're pulling all that information in every day. And they're using that to, they built this incredible just profile of you in order to manipulate you. And then they, what they do is like in the case of Facebook and Google, they charge people who need, want to manipulate you to do something, to vote in a certain way or to buy a certain thing, they charge people money to rent their manipulation machine. They, they call it advertising, but it's really just, hey, you know, you, 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 uh, you give me some money and you get to use my manipulation machine to manipulate these folks. So their whole business model is collect as much data about you and then use this license to manipulate you because we, you know, we never applied these original, these laws the, the railroad laws. We never applied the railroad laws to them, so they're free to manipulate us. So, okay, so Google, how would common carrier apply to Google? 
you know, I mean, with search, I mean, it's uh, what you want to have is that the search is uh, entirely transparent. You know, it's like you, you put the rules out there. You, everyone gets to see what happens. Uh, everyone gets the same basic search. If you want to uh, tweak your search, if you want to make it more personalized, you're the one who chooses how it's personalized. It's not them personalizing for you. You know, you can go in there and, and say, I only, you know, I only want to look at things in the in my local town. I only want to look at things and in, 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 um, you know, uh, that apply to, you know, if I'm a, a, you know, a man of a certain age, it's like, okay, I want to put this, this circle around me. But, um, you know, but the thing is that to the extent that anything is personalized, it's done by you. And then otherwise you get a generic search. You and know. you know, what I do is I don't use Google anymore. I use DuckDuckGoGo, which is one that, that gives yeah. you these kinds of features. Yeah, no. So we actually again here. It's we have we have these alternative models out there that show us that the uh, you know the Google model is not necessary. That you know uh, that we can have a good life without being manipulated and exploited and 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 and, and extracted in the way that uh, Google and Facebook uh, uh, do it. So now, there's you, yeah. You just referred to Google Search, but Google is so much bigger than just search. You're, you're talking about you're yeah. talking about YouTube. You're talking about Gmail and and uh, Maps, and Chrome, and Android, Android, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Double Click, DeepMind. You know, it's like they they control. You know, they, Google is not a single monopoly it's not just search it's a whole cluster of monopolies that all reinforce each other and they tie them all together so the information so it's they use every one of these uh, these portals to extract information about you and to manipulate you yeah they so even you change to, your yeah. name from google to alphabet they cover you from a to z they sure do and uh, so this is now and and this is the, the the key thing that you know in, in liberty from all masters is it's like these are becoming our masters google facebook and amazon are becoming masters of our lives in ways that we have never seen before and what we you know we have you know it, it's happening so fast and it's happening in ways that we can barely you know sort of keep track of we can barely understand um that if we don't act soon we're going to find it like too late so what's so what I'm encouraging folks to do, you know, and I'm hoping people the reason to read the book is actually just to understand that uh, that we do have all these tools, and so that uh, people understand how to it's it's not to protect yourself by like going from Google to DuckDuckGo because that's you can't you can't escape you can escape a little bit, but you can't escape from a, a monopoly. There is no escape from monopoly. Yeah, this well, podcast is going to go up on YouTube. Yeah. And I'm going to send out emails using Gmail. I mean, yeah. the only know. way to escape is to you, you. You can't escape using your dollar. Milton Friedman used to say, oh, well, vote with your dollar. Michael Pollan used to say, vote with your fork. You know what? That's only that fixes things only at the margins and only when there's no monopolist. If there's a monopolist, you can't vote with your fork. You can't vote with your dollar. You're stuck. The only thing you can vote with is your vote. The only tool you got is your politics. The only tool you got is this is, is your government. So you better go and grab a hold of your government. You better use it against the monopolist because that's how you set yourself free. All right. So we need to take another break. And when we come back, let's talk a little bit about how we can do this. And my guest for this show is Barry Lynn. He directs the Open Markets Institute and is the author of a new book, Liberty from All Masters, The New American Autocracy Versus the Will of the People. So how do we deal with this monopoly situation? How do we deal with these new hyper-monopolistic giant platforms, Google and Amazon and Facebook? Well, yes, it's, and that's a, that is the question of the moment, you know, because, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're, you know, we've been paying attention. A lot of folks have been thinking that the, the greatest threat to our lives was Donald Trump. You know, the greatest threat to our lives was, you know, the GOP. And um, the, um, you know, the really the, the, I mean, 
you know, Donald Trump uh, in many ways is just a symptom of this concentration of power, this disruption of, 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 uh, uh, of, of the political economy that we had in, our, in, in America for all these years of the open type of, uh, you know, sharing system that we, we had uh, by all these monopolists. Uh, so, you know, this is the, in many ways, it's the, it's the, the great threat to us is, is, uh, is monopolization, you know? So, um, so how do we deal with it? You know, it's, well, it, we use the government to break the monopolies. That's what America was created to do. That's what the, in the, in the beginning, the, the constitution, the declaration of independence was we are independent from the, inter, the, the British trading system. We are independent. We are not subject to other people's corporations. The constitution was the greatest anti-monopoly document ever built because it broke power everywhere. It wasn't just state power. It was also the private power of private corporations because people felt if you break the power of the state, nobody in the state can align themselves with private corporations in ways that concentrate too much power and put other people's uh, uh, liberty at threat. So the way to deal with this is to pick up our state and use it and to use it in the original way that it was intended to be used uh, going back to the 18th century. And that is to break all concentrations of power at home and abroad that threaten our liberty and our democracy. That's the purpose of the state. Now, how do we do that today? It's already happening, it's starting. You know, the, we were talking about the Cicilline Committee in Congress. Uh, the Cicilline Committee in Congress, Congressman Cicilline and his team, they created a, 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 a blueprint, a, a map for dealing with the entire online economy and making it safe for our democracy. They created that map. What's it look and like? Yeah. Hmm? What's it look like? Well, it means uh, number one, you neutralize the corporations. You know, you you force them to uh, treat everybody the same, the same prices, same same terms of service, uh, no favoritism. And then you have to break some things up. You know, you, we were just talking about Google. Google, you know, is there any reason whatsoever why YouTube should be connected to Maps? Is there any reason why Maps should be connected to Gmail? Is there any reason why Gmail needs to be connected to Android? Is there any reason Android needs to be connected to Chrome? The answer in every case is no. So if they don't need to be connected, we can disconnect them and we probably should disconnect them. We need to break up Google, uh, you know, all those different monopolies, separate them. Also, if, well, if we did that, what would it look like? Would they be separate companies then or yeah, would they, could yeah. they be nationalized? This is actually the Microsoft case. There was a big uh, antitrust case against Microsoft back in the late nineties. Uh, the original order was to break off the disc operating uh, system uh, part the DOS part of Microsoft uh, from the um, uh, from the part of the company that was uh, selling uh, 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 the browser. And they said these don't need to be connected. We're gonna you know we're gonna create a market so that anybody you know the the DOS is just it's it, it's a it's a railroad is what they said. So using the Microsoft model, we just apply that to Google, and the result is we're gonna break off YouTube. We'll break off. Uh, you know, and, and make these as separate uh, companies. And, you know, you, you were, you're talking about this won't affect our lives. It'll make our lives better. You, you were talking about DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo has a mapping feature. DuckDuckGo doesn't own a mapping feature, but if you type in an address in DuckDuckGo, you, you, get, you go on a map. Now it happens to be the Apple map, right? So, but they're integrated with the Apple map. They're, they're well, not- the, the world of technology has what are called APIs, application programming <laughs> interfaces that allow anybody to connect with different sources and different services so they can work together. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, you know, I, I mean, it's, you know, uh, uh, you know we, we, we laugh at the, you know, nowadays at the old sort of techno libertarians, you know, the techno utopians, the, the folks who said, hey, the internet's gonna allow us to do anything and everything, you know, we can, and, you know, people like John Perry Barlow, you know, and, that, you know, and, uh, you know, the fact is, is that uh, they weren't wrong. The internet actually, the internet itself was created in a way that power was distributed. 
that you know you could you know it was designed to be a system in which you know relatively small discrete individuals and applications moved around uh, uh, freely. What happened with Google, Facebook, and Amazon is that they have monopolized how we interact with the internet. And the other thing is, I mean, the internet has given power to a lot of people, to millions, maybe billions of people who didn't have access to it before. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it, it's done that. But then you've got these little groups, these giant groups in specific places where they build it up and they turned it into something ugly and dangerous as you characterize it. Yeah, so it's like these technologies are great. I mean, they, they, you know, there's maybe, you know, I mean, there are certain problems. I mean, people become addicted to social media, people become addicted to gaming, you know, that's, but, you know, sending aside that is like, these technologies have made life better. They've allowed us to connect in ways that are really important. So the technologies, the internet is, itself is good. The, you know, uh, the, being able to search the internet well, you know, like using the original Google search back in 1999, 2000, I remember that wonderful technology, fantastic technology. Te so technologies are good. And what we want is to make sure that the technologies are actually available to all of us and they're not being uh, sort of delivered to us by just a, a one or two or three corporations. And what's scary, what you describe is how, what these giant massive monopolies are doing is they make it hard for us to even see the way they're doing this to us. We're like fish in water, not even aware that, that we're in water and that, that we're being manipulated and massaged and influenced and that's the scary part. Yeah, every day we kind of wake up and uh, we're just a little bit further down the road to actually having forgotten what it is to be free, to having forgotten what it is to be in control of our own lives, to go, you know, being able to go where we want to go, buy what we want to buy, live the kind of lives that we want to live, you know, sort of achieve the destinies that we want to achieve, you know. That's what America, that's why Americans created America was to give every one of us the ability to make ourselves into the most full person that we want to be, and, you know, to do live entirely the life that we want to live. And what's happening with these corporations is every day we wake up and we are more and more subject to them. We are more and more just little pawns that they move around to serve their interests, you know. We, 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 they use us, we don't use them. Now, the thing is, what you describe in the book is how we were screwed, really. I mean, this is a relatively recent thing that's happened. And the people who betrayed us, who betrayed 200 years of expanding liberties, they're, they're the heroes of both parties. It's Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter. Uh, you, you even talk about how Obama failed and, and, and how Trump's a flawless catastrophe. <laughs> so, so give us a little bit of the history of, of how Reagan and Carter and, and Clinton did this to us. Yeah, this is, it, it, this is one of the most important things I want to get, you know, get across in Liberty from All master, Masters is that ideas matter, that philosophy really matters, that ideology matters, that, that the way you see the world matters. You know, so the American Revolution was an ideological revolution. It was uh, uh, people, you know, who were at the beginning, they saw themselves in a different way. You know, before the revolution, they were subjects of a king. They were subjects of lords. You know, they saw themselves within a hierarchy. The entire world they saw as you know, having, you know, there, there are people on top and then there were people in the middle and there are people on the bottom. And, the, you know, uh, and that's just the way it is. That's just the way it was. And there was no way out of it. That's the, what God created. The American revolution said, no, we're all equal. It was a bottom up revolution. <laughs> it was a bottom up revolution. And so we're all equal. We all stand together. There is no hierarchy. We got no bosses. You don't have a boss. So that's, and then we had to figure out for 200 years how to keep it that way, you know, how to build a system that allows us to have no bosses. And people kept trying to boss us. That's what the planters did, the, the slavers. They tried to boss us. They, they 
clearly they, you know, they did absolutely terrible things to the slaves, but they also tried to boss all the rest of us. They, they took control of our politics and they tried to turn, you know, everybody into, you know, make them subject to their power. The plutocrats did the same thing. They tried to boss us. So we broke the power of the slavers and we broke the power of the plutocrats and we kept our system uh, that protected us from bosses alive and well for 200 years. And then what happened is this new idea came up. We were talking about this new idea of the, of the neoliberals of the, you know, and, and this idea that uh, we, you know, we should seek efficiency foremost, that we should seek efficiency for, to serve our interests as consumers. And that was instead, of, instead of, instead of liberty for the citizen, democracy for our community, we're going to seek efficiency for our welfare as consumers. That's you know, so they changed. They took the laws and they flipped them upside down. They revolutionized them, or really, it was a counter revolution. They overthrew what we achieved in the American Revolution, and. All of the governments, this was achieved, uh, it started under Reagan, it was accelerated under Bill Clinton. And, but every single president since 1981, every single administration has basically followed this new philosophy. So that's what, you know, right now, day one, what we need to be doing on day one of a Biden administration is actually flipping this back saying, we're not going to actually have this philosophy of consumer welfare governing us anymore. How, do we, how does Biden get persuaded to do that when he's been such a corporatist over the years? You know, it's, uh, it's a different world. You know, he, you know, you know, Biden, you know, he, he's somebody who, you know, Washington for the last 35 years, everybody pretty much thought the same. You know, this is the way the world works. This was the governing philosophy. These were this, these were the ideas that if if you if you didn't believe these ideas, you're an idiot. Okay. Now we actually realize that these were crazy ideas. We're waking up to the fact that what Bork and Friedman and Posner, the ideas that they foisted on us, neoliberalism, that those were the crazy well, ideas. Not, I mean, let's let Obama brought in Summers and Rubin and his whole team. They were in the same world too, weren't they? Absolutely. Yeah, no. And it's like, and so now Biden, you know, uh, he lived in this world. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is this awakening. And it's because there's so much concentrated power. But it's also because groups like mine, we've actually, you know, going back, my, my last book, Cornered, came out in 2010. You know, that was the first book that said, hey, we got a monopoly problem in America, and we have, we have to do something about it. You know, so there's been a fight over neoliberalism, for the last 10 years, 12 years, uh, uh, and it was has been centered on this philosophy of anti-monopoly. This is the core thing that the neoliberals did. There's many books about neoliberalism. Most of them miss the core thing that they did. What they did is they overthrew our anti-monopoly laws. They overthrew our American system of liberty. This is what we have to turn back around. Biden, you know, what we now have is a whole set of analysis. We have a book like my new book, Liberty from All Masters, that actually provides a guide for what we want to do and how to do it, that connects, that helps people relearn what the true idea of America is and how Americans use that idea for 200 years to make ourselves free. And to now, make how do we get that into the conversation? I mean, uh, a lot of the ideas that were uh, discussed by the Democrats, at least in, in the, this most recent election, they came out of Occupy Wall Street, you know, the 99 percent. And mm -hmm. uh, I, how do we take this concept that we need to get get back to fighting monopolies and make it a major part of the conversation? In Washington, it's become a much bigger part of the conversation. My group, you know, I've worked personally closely with uh, Senator Warren. Uh, you know, we've worked personally closely with Senator uh, Sanders. Uh, we've worked, uh, you know, with, with Senator Booker and Senator Klobuchar. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've worked with Republicans on this issue. So um, we've worked with, you know, uh, uh, Senator Rubio and we've worked, we've had conversations with Senator Cruz. Now you're talking about Open Markets Institute? 
Open Markets Institute. Yeah. So, you know, uh, S Senator Warren gave a fantastically important speech about this issue in, in June 29th of 2016. Uh, I hosted that speech. I remember it very well. So um, and that, you know, so when Senator Warren gave that speech in, in, in June 29th of 2016, that in Washington had a huge effect. Now, what we have so in Washington, this discussion is happening. What we need to do now is actually take this discussion and bring it out to the rest of the world so that everybody in the world is taking part in this the conversation, is pressuring the people in Washington to, to, to push through and destroy the neoliberal idea and the neoliberal power structure. Now, we, where does Rubio get involved in this? How does this push a Republican's buttons? You know, it's, it's um, the, um, I mean, that's a, you know, Republicans, uh, this is one of the things that we have to, uh, the, the Republicans and the Democrats are together on this. Really? Yes. And this is, you know, I know we're at the, the top of the hour and this is something, but, the, you know, we should leave folks with this, 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 this idea. It's like the Cicilline committee in the House, the Republicans on that committee support the basic findings and the basic conclusions of the majority of the Democrats. The Republicans are working hand in hand with the Democrats to destroy the monopolies that control our lives. The, the antitrust case against Google that was launched by the Trump administration, that didn't come out of the Trump administration. That came because every state in the union plus Puerto Rico, plus the District of Columbia opened investigations, antitrust investigations of Google every state in the union opened investigations of Google and they forced the Trump administration to pick this up. But that was it. Republican attorneys general working with Democrat attorneys general, all of them working together. So when it comes to monopoly, because monopoly is a direct threat to democracy, this is a case, it's one of those rare cases where Democrats and Republicans work together because they all, they know that if Google Amazon and Facebook win, we all lose and we all lose forever. That's why we're going, we're pushing forward in this to win, but that's why every single person out there needs to be part of this fight. It, it's a bottom up revolution. It is a revolution that, uh, uh, that requires everybody to be pushing in the same direction and being confident that we shall overcome these corporations and we shall. All right, I think that's a perfect place to end. My guest for this show has been Barry Lynn, who directs the Open Markets Institute, and his book is Liberty from All Masters, The New American Autocracy versus the Will of the People. Thanks so much. Great, really. Great to talk to you.